got a lockdown diary is day 23. Sorry for last night. Um, I was down the unit doing a, the, the YouTube live and, and I don't have Wi-Fi down there. I was relying on my signal uh, and I finished the video off, turned it around and realised that my data had run out about three minutes before the end. So uh, that's that's the reason for the abrupt ending yesterday uh, and that website www.nathanmillward.com uh, for the mugs. Uh, but I've had plenty, some good orders today, so thank you for that. Uh, today I just wanted to talk about border crossings. Um, I think it's a topic that people worry about when they're going on a, an extended trip. And I think even for us a lot in the UK, I think border, you know, border crossing is going to be more of more of a relevance, uh, you know, this coming year and these coming years than it ever has been. What with Brexit and things, and uh, I think wherever you are in the world, uh, the approach is pretty much universal. Whether you're crossing borders in Asia or uh, America or in Europe, I, I think you know the principle of being polite, uh, confident, and accepting that you just don't. You're not in control. Uh, you are, in a sense, powerless to um, to the proceedings, and you've just got to accept it for what it is. Not get too irate, not to get too mad, not get too stressed. Try and remain calm. I think confidence is crucial. I think if you show fear or or uh, trepidation, certainly if you're on your own, I think it's very easy to get swallowed up by the uh, border process. I mean, obviously in Western Europe, it's relatively civilized as it is in North America. But to be honest, crossing the border from North America into Canada can be quite daunting just with the way that, uh, you know, the system is set up to almost feel, it almost criminalise you before you've even answered a question. It gets your guilt levels up, it gets your anxiety up. Uh, and I think that's obviously a deliberate attempt to get, to trip people up. And, and so I think being aware or prepared for the border procedure is always worth knowing or doing. Uh, because to to arrive at the border a little bit wet around the ears as I first did, I mean my first board, real border crossing I suppose was when I crossed from East Timor into West Timor, uh, and that was a um, you know it's quite a, a tropical island. There's not a lot of there's not many towns or anything, so the border is just in the middle of a, a sort of a jungle clearing. And I arrived there just kind of thinking, hey, you know, you just turn up and give me your passport, stamp it, and away you go. But no, no, you off your bike, park it up going to one building and obviously the issue of language uh, barriers or you know, differences is a bigger issue in itself um, but then just the process and then you've got fixers there who kind of want to instigate the the transaction uh, or the the agreement or the exchange for a share of money uh, and and when you're in a country where you don't understand the language and somebody's approaching you with a bit of English saying you know, give me a passport and, and, I don't know, five dollars or whatever, and I'll sort it out and make it quick. And, you, you know, it's that do I trust, don't I trust. Uh, and, and I mean, generally, in those, I'm going to say developing parts of the world, and not so that, that's not necessarily to be detrimental to them, but I guess it helps us understand which countries I mean. But, say, Indonesia... You know, it, it, it kind of is how the system works. There is a fixer at a border, and almost the border guards are expecting you to use a fixer, certainly if you don't speak the native language. Uh, obviously, it adds complication when you've got the Carnada Passage as well, uh, and then you've got something else, an additional complication uh, and communication thing to, to get around. But, you know, I, I was very nervous, or blasé, let's say, when I when I entered from East to West Timor. I didn't really know what to expect, and... Uh, I probably wasn't very confident in, confident in myself and I think people, you know, they can read that body language. So I'd say even if you are apprehensive, fearful, try not to look it, try not to act it. Um, I mean, as I, as I progressed, you know, you get a little bit more understanding of the way things are. You learn to stand more solidly on your two feet and, and, and sort of realise that you, you're not in control, but at the same time, if you step backwards, somebody will step into your space type thing. So you have to be assertive, but not aggressive. And I can understand how some people could get into a bit of a, into an argument or an agreement at a border by simply having that sort of uh, physical, aggressive demeanour. And it's just not going to get you anywhere. But then neither is it if you're completely passive and submissive either. I mean, even crossing the borders in Eastern Europe, when you've got a huge cure traffic you know if your tendency is to sit back and sit in the traffic you'll be there all day but if you've got the gumption to to ride to the front and present your passport you know when you enter Serbia Montenegro those sort of countries you'll be through in through in minutes so it's a I think really 
the way you cross borders really pulls out the type of person you are in life and how uh, confident, confidence, confident you are. Uh, I mean, for me, the biggest issue I had, the biggest problem, was uh, having crossed. Well, actually, no. Let me start with the crossing into China. I mean, that was that's quite a daunting experience because when you cross into China, you're met by this is at the top of the Karakoram Highway. There's a there's a wooden building there. I mean, it's very remote, very mountainous, and there's a wooden building there. And the army, so the soldiers come out and they offload pretty much everything off your bike. They ask if you've got memory cards, laptops, phones, and then they take them away. Uh, and then they drive them down to the headquarters, which is sort of 80 miles away down the, at the end of the, the Friendship Highway, further into China. And that's when they've assessed them, looked through them, made sure you've not got anything that you shouldn't have, and then you finally get it back. So, you know, dealing with entrance into China, it was very much a, you've got to be passive, you've got to give them what you want, but you've got to show some uh, strength in your demeanour so you don't get walked all over. You've got to ask the questions and push when you when you need to, um, and it, it's a negotiation, I, I think. Uh, and it's quite you know it's quite exciting. It, the tension builds as you approach a border because you never know how it's going to go. You don't know how briskly it's going to go through, or whether you're going to be held up there for for hours. And and that's the example I was going to use when I left um, Kyr so Kyrgyzstan, rode across Kazakhstan, and then to leave Kazakhstan into Russia. Uh, I, I took a route that took me onto a quite a remote crossing. Uh, still a main route, but not where any towns were. And it was just a sort of a, a Mad Max style fort in the middle of nowhere, uh, with fencing around it, and then the huts in the middle. And um, you know, for whatever reason, um, they they didn't like the look of me and, and made it as difficult as as possible. And it took four hours uh, getting through there because they'll claim that you should have had a particular document that when you entered they said that you didn't need, but now suddenly you need it to leave. Uh, and, and then starts a game of intimidation. So they'll get you to sit in a, in a secluded office, or in my case a port cabin, and they'll ask you for $120 or $130, and that's to expedite your, pro, you know, your, your progress through the border. And unfortunately, I guess there are plenty of travellers who may be in, in, a, in haste, and with enough currency to just pay that money. But if you're travelling on a tight budget and a border guard's asked you for $120 and that's your budget for the following week, then ultimately something has to give. And and that's when you really do deep, have to dig deep and say, I'm not I'm not paying you that or no. And then obviously they realise they're going to do something else so you'll send you somewhere else and they'll, they'll basically clock watch and basically just try and grind you down until the point that, which you just submit to what they're asking for. So one plate, one guy, another guy, another de desk asks for, sort of, I think, $90, then back to being asked for 125 euros, and then back to, and you go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And uh, I, I met some travellers, some German travellers, Andreas and Claudia, going across Kazakhstan, and they said that, you know, the best thing is to be polite, but also be a nuisance. Uh, you know, because if, you, if you're a nuisance, and you get in their way and, and you just cause them an headache, then they will eventually let you go. Uh, and I did, I just sat eating bread and I, I kind of left my bags everywhere. And I think eventually, you know, they realise that they're not legally entitled and, and, and if they call for backup from a higher place of authority, they wouldn't have the power to, to detain you in the way that they're doing. But, you know, it's a game of who, who's going to blink first. And, and, and if you're not in any hurry, then... You know, I'm not. Uh, you've got to deal with each situation as you find it. But for me, if you sit it out, generally they'll get they'll cave in eventually. And that's the same with the police or anybody who might try and stop you stop you along your way. You know, if you sit them out, if you make them realise they're losing money by keeping you there, they will eventually go. I mean, that's obviously dependent on everything being in order. You know, if you know you're in the right, eventually I guess you do get exonerated and let through but that was that was kind of a nervous experience to be honest you know when you shut in a, a door shut on you in a, in a in a steel room and you're left alone with two strong looking Kazakh men who want some money out of you and you, you've got the money on your uh, the money in a, a waist belt around your, your waist but they want to see inside your wallet and you show them an empty wallet but you know you've got sort of five hundred dollars in your waist belt you it does make you a little bit edgy but uh you know that's when again dig deep say no and eventually they, they let me go. Entering Russia by by complete contrast, very formal, very easy. Um, and the signs up saying if anybody tries to extort you, here's a number, call that number. Somebody did ask about sort of frontier insurance because once you once you get out here, you know your insurance that you've got on your bike is worth nothing. 
Uh, and entering Russia, for example, I'm trying to think, was Kazakhstan the same? No, I don't think so. But entering Russia, there were some booths at the border that you had to buy insurance from. Um, and, you know, and it's the same with it when you enter Serbia or any of the other countries that don't take the green card. There'll be offices where you can buy sort of a temporary insurance on the vehicle. I don't think it's personally worth, worth the paper it's written on. But if you need it to get through the border and to give to the police in the event of an incident or being stopped, then unfortunately you've just got to suck it up, pay it, and hope that you don't have an accident. But it comes back to, would I take an expensive bike to go around the world? No, because that insurance that I buy at the border in Russia, for example, or wherever, Thailand, I think, is, is not going to cover a £10,000 BMW GS. You know, it's just not. And your own insurance is not going to cover it either. So that bike gets stolen or falls off a cliff, goodbye, £10,000 bike. So that, for me, is, all, is, is what steers me to a cheaper bike. Um, the only other incident I had coming to uh, Ukraine, I got a lot of issue there and uh, I think again it just taking a dislike to me, maybe there was something about me at the time that uh, I think it was, it was he was calling me and I was either to, to, to come into the office to give me my paperwork and I was too busy on my phone or doing something, I was distracted and so by the time he'd asked me, had to ask me twice he was, he was upset and cross with me and, and frustrated and he got an empty afternoon so he made me literally empty out all my bags. It made me take the fuel tank off to make sure I wasn't carrying drugs in the fuel tank and in the side cases. And, you know, and that was intimidating because, you know, I, I knew I wasn't, I knew I was, wasn't in the wrong, but he, I was completely at the mercy of this man's menace. And so you think, if he, if he suddenly pulls out a white packet of powder and says it was on my bike, then I've got nowhere to go. I've got no evidence to say it wasn't. And, that does race through your heart a little bit. So, I mean, the lesson I learned in that incident was be, uh, play, pay attention, you know, concentrate on the job in hand. Don't get distracted by playing on your phone or, you know, chatting to someone else. You've got a border to cross, pay attention to the man who's, who's going to expedite that, give him respect, show him that you'll stand your ground and generally you'll get through. You know, it's the same when you cross in North, North America into Canada, as I said, you know, you've just got to present yourself confidently. Uh, because, it, it, you know, as soon as you crack, as soon as you crumble, as, as soon as you, you start to doubt your own mind, that's when, it's, uh, that's when it, it becomes uh, problematic. But, you know, most people get through borders all right. I mean, I know Bruce Smart, who, tried to do, who went around the world on the Suzuki uh, GSX-1000, he had issues when he first set off coming down to Africa. He, he had issues at the Mauritanian uh, border, and I think it's what made him ultimately turn back on that first trip, just because it... The, the intimidation, uh, and I think he had some things stolen and there were people, you know, another tourist was was beaten up or something for not, I don't know, you know, uh, for something. So I don't, I think you've got to watch yourself, you know, let's not pretend that this is like crossing uh, Dover Calais, this, this is something else uh, and it's not beyond anyone. You've just got to prepare yourself psychologically for it and, and accept it's going to be difficult. I mean, basic things like take, make sure you've got water, make sure you've got some fluids and some snacks with you because it could be a long day. Uh, make sure you've got your documents to hand, so your car your passport, make sure it's all there. Also take photocopies where possible because when I crossed from uh, Nepal into India, they wanted photocopies. So they say, well, where's your photocopy? And you're like, I don't know. Uh, and so you have to go out into the village to find somewhere to photocopy, to come back and then go through it all again. So, you know, go go armed, go ready, go prepared, whether it's with fluids. You know, there's also a suggestion that don't leave it till the last minute late in the day uh, because there just won't be time. So try and camp before the border the night before, get there nice and early, you know, and, and where possible get some local advice as to whether there's any, you know, cut-throughs for motorbikes or anything like that because there's a lot of borders which are bike-friendly and they'll let you, let you go to the front. And... But ultimately, everything comes down to personalities and, and, and your ability to deal with that person and their ability to deal with you. And, and so there's no hard and fast rule with border crossing. It's just, there's no, no hard and fast rule with anything else in life. It's just dealing with it as, as, it, as you come and being flexible enough to cope with that, that situation. And also accepting that you're going to be stressed, that you're going to be strained, that it's going to make you nervous and edgy and you're going to get across that border I mean, when I finally got out of Kazakhstan, I felt like I could survive a battle. And um, I, it was a huge amount of relief when I set up camp that evening and went to sleep. Uh, and, you know, you breathe a big sigh of relief and it becomes a big part of your adventure. 
Um, I mean, hopefully with Brexit, we won't have quite a, as much of an issue getting into, into Europe. But uh, with the way things are going at the minute, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be easy or not. Uh, I mean, I'm sure people who've um, come down through South America, they'd be interested in the comments maybe. You know, did you find it easy, difficult? Has anybody come through Africa? Did they find it easy or different, difficult? Any advice that anybody's got, you know, just put them in the comments comments section. Let you know, try and make it a bit more interactive rather than me saying uh, saying what I think. Because uh, there's lots of people out there who've got some really good knowledge knowledge and advice. And that's what I was going to maybe try to do to develop this, try and get other people on board and, and do some Zoom meetings and things with other people who've got stories to tell or experience to give to try and make it a little bit more interactive so you see less of my face. <laughs> As dishevelled as it is, so that's it. Day twenty three border crossings. Um, they are part of the fabric of motorcycle or overland travel. You can't avoid them, but just go with strong, sturdy shoulders, politeness, and common sense and patience. I guess they're they're the main thing. So that's it. I'll try I'll try, I'll try and get that GS Iceland video up uh, tomorrow. It's just I've been uh, looking after the. Uh, 18 month old today, so that's been a slight sideline. So, yeah, I hope everyone's keeping well, taking it easy. Cheers.